Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. I have some things I want to let you guys know about coming up. Uh, camp registrations are now open for both kids camp and for youth camp. We strongly encourage you to get your kids and your teenagers to camp this summer. It's going to be so good to be back together in that venue again. So both registrations are open. You can talk to Matthew or Victoria for more information. Links are on our church Facebook group, uh, and we'd love to talk to you about getting your kids or your teenagers to camp. On that note, next Sunday, that's Sunday, June the 12th, following our in-person service in the morning, the student ministry team is going to be hosting a barbecue fundraiser with all proceeds going towards helping uh, kids and teenagers attend camp. So we want to encourage you to come out, be a part of the fundraiser barbecue that day after church. Enjoy some good food, some time together with one another, and give towards sending our kids off to camp this year. Uh, Also next Sunday following church, uh, right after that barbecue fundraiser, is going to be a VBS training session for all volunteers serving VBS this summer. So if you're looking, uh, if you've already signed up to be a volunteer, please make sure to be here next Sunday after church for the VBS training session. If you're still thinking about it, it'd be a great way to get involved, to uh, understand what's required of you, and to be a part of hosting VBS for our kids this summer. And registration is still open for your kids as well. To be a part of that week, that's July 18th to the 21st, $25 per kid, and we'd love to see your kids here for VBS that week. Uh, last announcement, uh, Party in the Park is back this year. It's going to be a Friday night, June 24th from 6 to 9 p.m. at Wade Road Park. We can't wait to be able to host our community again to meet people, to get to know them, tell them about our church, and to have a great, fun party together. Uh, So as always, we need help putting this on. This is not a church picnic. This is us as a church hosting our community on that evening. So in that three-hour window that we're running the event, we want people to sign up for hour-long windows of service. Uh, We have a variety of areas. You can sign up to uh, supervise one of the inflatables that kids will be playing on. You can sign up for setup. You can sign up for cleanup. You can sign up for food service uh, in an hour chunk there. Uh, we just want to get out and make sure you are involved in hosting our community. So please come talk to any staff member or go to our Facebook group and sign up on the Google form uh, for being involved in Party in the Park. We encourage you to be that night. Bring your friends. Bring your family. It's going to be a great night of spending time here in the park hosting our community. Uh, be there. Be involved. It's going to be great. All right. I'll be back in a second as we bring the next message in our uh, series of the book of Revelation. Hope you're excited. Hope you're ready. Church starts now. Well, good day, church. Does anybody, anybody remember this thing? This tug-of-war rope was a staple at church picnics, at men's retreats, and at summer camps for years Leading me to one simple question. Why? (laughs) Why did we think this was a good idea? I'm going to tell you right now. I have PTSD from this thing. I remember rope burn on my hands. I remember bodies flying everywhere. It was comical, like in the train wreck sense of the word only. How we ever got parents to sign off on their kids doing this, I'll never know. I made the mistake this week. Don't look up injury risk for tug of war on the Wikipedia page. Just trust me on that one. You don't want to go down that road. And yet, we still have this thing hanging around the church for some reason. It's still here. I'm confident that we all know how this works. Two teams line up. Rope is marked with a center line, and there's two markings put on either side of center. The object, of course, is for you and your team to pull the opposing team and the mark closest to them over the center line. It's a test of strength. It's also a test of endurance. Often it's won in in small gains. It's very very rare that it's won in one colossal pull by some strongman at the end. It's usually won in small gains. There can be a lot of back and forth, even periods of complete stalemate where either the teams are equally matched in strength or just equally exhausted and just sit there in a stalemate. Now here's an interesting fact. The phrase tug of war originally meant the decisive contest, the real struggle or tussle a severe contest for supremacy. It wasn't until the 19th century that the term tug-of-war was used to describe an athletic contest. And this is why we're talking about this today. It's week five of our Victorious series, studying the seven churches found in the first few chapters of Revelation. The church we're looking at today from the city of Pergamum 
is in the midst of a tug of war. They're in the midst of a severe contest for supremacy. Not in the athletic sense, not in the sense of a physical war, but in a battle for the minds of the people. Besieged from the outside by an idolatrous culture around them, infiltrated from within by false teachers and deceptive doctrine, like this rope in a tug of war, they are being pulled in many directions. Will they give in? Will they stand strong? And ultimately, will we give in or will we stand strong? Because here's the honest truth. The message to the church in Pergamum is incredibly relevant for all followers of Christ seeking to remain faithful in the postmodern pluralistic society that we find ourselves in. So let's pray, and then we're going to get into all this. God, we just thank you for the opportunity again today to look into your word, to take a moment to hear you speak to us. God, I just pray for your, your grace to cover this time. I pray for uh, your wisdom and your knowledge and your understanding to cover this time. As we head into some difficult territory, we're going to really be looking at um, specific issues, specific sins, specific concerns. God, I pray that there would not be judgment. I pray that there would not be um, guilt or shame in a negative sense. But God, I pray that you would speak clearly to us, that you would convict where conviction is needed, that you would reveal where revelation is needed. Uh, and God, that above all, we would know how deeply you love and care for us, and that out of your love and care, you're going to point out things, you're going to poke things, you're going to ask us to look at things and ask the hard questions. So guys, pray that you just cover this time together. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, let's start with the letter itself, and then we'll get into some needed context and go from there. So we're picking up in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. It says, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas. My faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Now, if you're taking notes, I'm thinking that you probably have at least four things written down with a little, what the heck does this mean next to it? So, I'm going to Cole's notes the obvious stumbling blocks so that we're all on the same page and not distracted by the language and the references, and then can move on from there. So let's tackle the big one first. Jesus says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. I mean, that's a pretty harsh statement. So what does that mean? Basically, it's a pointed description of the city of Pergamum. At this point in history, this city was the center of Caesar worship. Behind the city rose a conical hill, but a thousand feet high, on which stood a whole host of temples and altars to a variety of gods. It included the temple of Asclepios, the god of medicine or healing. The other prominent temple was built in honor of Zeus, the greatest of the Greek pantheon. The city of Pergamum was a hub of idol worship and false gods. So when Jesus comes and says, where you live is where Satan has his throne, what he's saying is that due to the proliferation of idol worship and false gods, this is a city where Satan has won some victories. This is a city where Satan has a, there's a a stronghold of his demonic and evil influence because of the, the amount of idol worship and false gods going on in this city. Going down a little bit further in the letter, the mention of this person named Antipas, it's a very simple answer there. He was one of the first martyrs in this region for the faith. He was killed for what he believed in. Then, then we reference Balaam and Balak. What's the deal there? It's an Old Testament reference. We're not going to go to the story today. We just don't have that amount of time. But you can read all about their story from the book of Numbers. Essentially, Balaam was a diviner. Balak, w- Balak was the king of Moab. And Balaam had showed the king how to lead the Israelites astray. 
And the reason why it's brought up is that the same tactics that Balaam taught Balak are the tactics we see at work in the church in Pergamum. Balaam is really just a fitting prototype for the corrupt teachers that the church of the New Testament faced, uh, the kind of teachers who attempted to deceive the followers of Christ through compromise. And then the Nicolaitans, we talked about them a few weeks ago. They were a heretical group that had made their way into a number of churches in Asia at this time. Most likely, they taught the same things. They spread the same deception as the Balaamite group. And here's an interesting, you know, fun fact. I don't know if it's fun, but it's an interesting fact. Nicolaitans is a Greek word. Balaam is a Hebrew word. They mean the same thing. Both words, when you break them down, uh, mean to conquer the people. In other words, both groups of false teachers, those who follow the teaching of Balaam, those who follow the teaching of Nicholas, are appropriately named as they sought to conquer the minds of the people. And then lastly, you may have written down, why would I want hidden manna and a white stone? What kind of reward is that? Well, for that one, you're going to have to stay with me to the end, okay? All right, hopefully that covers the confusing bits. I don't want us to get tripped up on these words and ideas we're not familiar with. So hopefully that covers the confusing bits, gives some context. Let's get on with where we're going. The church in Pergamum is facing a battle on two fronts, overtly on the outside, covertly on the inside. They are standing strong on one front but losing ground on the other. They had the ability to resist the pagan influence from the outside but they were carelessly indifferent or unaware of the same influence from the inside. Jesus both commends this church for holding fast to his name, for holding fast to their faith. In the midst of outside pressure, they were holding fast. But then he also calls them out for this group amongst them that were holding on to false teaching in their midst. In his book, Discipleship on the Edge, Daryl Johnson makes the following observation. Most growing Christians are relatively able to spot and resist ideas that are blatantly contrary to God's will and way. It is the ideas that come to us wrapped in religious language which are more difficult to spot and resist. And this really serves to highlight the great challenge for the church, for us as followers of Jesus in this present age. The church seems to be really good at calling out sin in the world, trying to hold the moral line, so to speak. What they're doing is so bad and so wrong. But can we consider that perhaps we are blind or indifferent to the rot in our own churches and the rot in our own lives? Worse still, are we comfortable with it because we've dressed it up in the clothes of religious justification? I know what you're thinking. That's, that's some pretty tough talk. Let me explain what I mean. The false teachers in Pergamum They didn't deny Jesus outright. They weren't trying to make the Christians renounce their faith. Rather, they were just planting ideas that grew into compromise. They were planting um, seeds to win the battle for the minds of the people. And we know from last week that compromise is what leads to a lukewarm faith. Compromise is what leads to an ineffective witness in the world. The false teachers weren't out to destroy the church. They were just trying to make it irrelevant. So here's how the script goes. Here's what we might have heard in those gatherings from these false teachers amongst them. Hey, don't worry. Don't worry. You belong to Jesus. How can can anything hurt you? Like, no, don't worry about what you're doing. Nothing can hurt you. You belong to Jesus. You know what? You've been baptized, right? You've been baptized. And you you share in communion, right, with with your brothers and sisters. You you take communion. You remember what Jesus did, right? Nothing's going to affect your relationship with him. You've, You've done the things you need to do. You're good. In fact, do you guys remember, do you remember what Paul said? Paul said, you've been set free from the law. You know what that means? You're good to do whatever you want now. There's grace. It's totally okay. Does any of this sound familiar? You know, just just read your Bible. Just pray every day. Just come to church on Sunday. You're good. It doesn't matter what else you're doing. You've checked the right boxes. You know, know, maybe maybe you shouldn't be doing that. But hey, that's what grace is for, right? Do you see how easy it is to buy the lie of religious justification? Do you see how easy it is to slip into unhealthy patterns of living? Do you see how easy it is to wrap up false teaching in gospel language? At the end of the day, this type of justification gravely misunderstands the grace of God. Grace does not protect us when we willfully choose to disobey. 
Grace will forgive us. Grace will put us back on our feet again. Grace will love us and and accept us time after time after time after time. But grace doesn't remove consequence. Grace doesn't give us permission to sin as much as we want and still enjoy the fullness of life promised to us by Jesus. Grace is meant to transform us, not excuse us. So where are you at today? Are you in a tug of war for your mind? Are you strong over here but but slipping over here? Are you holding fast to God but also holding on to ungodly mindsets or ways of living? How's your discernment? Can you can you spot false teaching when it's wrapped in gospel language? I want us to keep these questions in mind as we zoom in on the specific issues of concern in the Pergamum church and unpack what their equivalent would be today. The message from Jesus to the church calls out two issues by name. It calls out eating food sacrificed to idols, and it calls out sexual immorality. Now, these were major areas of concern in the first century church, and, and they were named by the, the council in Jerusalem, that's Acts 15, Council in Jerusalem was a very important and famous gathering of church leaders. And at that council, they named these two areas of concern as the minimum expression of what it means to be a loyal follower of Jesus. So the leaders wrote this. This is from Acts 15, verse 28 and 29. It says, uh, they wrote, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. This is the bare minimum. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. So in this, this great council of trying to figure out what it meant for Jews and Gentiles to follow Christ and what, what rules and what laws and what ways of living people were supposed to go out, they decide, you know what? This is the bare minimum. This is, this is the, the lowest requirement. Abstain from food sacrifice to idols and from sexual immorality. But what do these mean? We're not the first century church. So do these issues even apply to us today? Is it the same thing? Is it a one-for-one? Food sacrifice to idols sounds far removed from our modern context. Like, I'm not sure I know anybody who does that. And sexual immorality means what exactly? I've, I've been around long enough. I've heard Christians place any number of things under this heading. So here's the deal. I don't want to gloss over these issues with the excuse of, yeah, first century problems, not relevant for us. I also don't want to go the usual Christian route of just saying, you know what, just worship God and be pure. Worship God and be pure. Idolatry and sexual morality are bad. Let's move on. Like I don't want to go that route. I'm hoping that we're all ready for more than just a surface-level explanation of the issues. So let's, let's look at what the concern was for the first century church. Let's unpack what that means. And then let's draw a line to some modern equivalents that we need to be aware of today. So let's start. Food sacrifice to idols. Quick history lesson. In that day and time, people would bring animals to the temple of their favorite god, and they'd offer a sacrifice. Now, part of the animal would be offered a sacrifice, and part would be returned to the worshiper. And you might go, wow, why would they give back part of the animal? And the idea behind that was that the person would then go home and have the honor uh, of hosting a sacred feast in honor of that God, in which they would invite friends and family to. Now, this, of course, created a dilemma for Christians in the first century. If they had come to know Jesus and started going to church and being a part of that fellowship, and their friends and families hadn't yet, they got invited to a family's house or a friend's house for this idol feast. They'd be like, can can we go? Like, can we? Should we go there? And, and if we do, can we, can we eat? Like, I'm just not sure what we do with this. And we might say it's just a meal. You know, what harm could it do? Now, first of all, to both the Jews and Gentiles of the day, eating a meal held much more meaning for them than it does for us now. Sharing a meal together at a table, it was a symbol, it was a sign of creating a bond of mutual loyalty. And for these meals held in honor of various gods, it was believed in that culture that the god himself or herself was a guest at the table. So if you follow that line of reasoning, in that culture, eating of the meat sacrificed to idols meant forming a bond with the god represented by that idol. Can you see how that could be a problem for Christians in the first century? Of course, we might come back and say, but, but the idol isn't real. We know that it's just wood or stone. We know the God is false. 
So, like, what's the big deal, right? Like, no harm, no foul. And we be partially correct. The wood is wood. The stone is stone. The food is food. Jesus is Lord, and the idol is nothing. Even Paul in 1 Corinthians, he says, food is just food. But if it causes another person to stumble, I'll choose to abstain. So there is this aspect of looking out for one another involved in this whole conversation. But what we often fail to understand is this. When we eat at the table of an idolatrous banquet, something spiritual is happening. Unseen and evil forces are at work. That God may be a false God. It may just be a wooden idol. But we understand there is an enemy, there is a deceiver of our souls, that Satan is at work. There are unseen and evil forces at work behind the scenes. So the real issue at hand is the matter of what we're opening up our lives to without even thinking or even realizing it. What are we opening our lives up to? You know, we don't have a ton of idols made of wood or stone hanging around today, but we do have idols. They just look different. Idols can be made up of cultural values. They can be made of political agendas and how we choose to align ourselves that way. Idols can be lifestyle choices. They can be corporate ethos. And yes, idols can even come out of religious movements. The celebrity culture that's quite prominent in, our, in, in the church worldwide right now is a, is a very clear case in point that even within the church, we can make idols of people and ideas and ways of doing, thing, doing things. And it's not good and it's not healthy. So I'm not going to stand here and point fingers and call it sin. I'm not be like, oh, you have an idol. You have an, I- you have an idol. I see that idol. We're not going to do that. That's not uplifting. That's not encouraging. What I am going to do is let the Holy Spirit do the work of moving and speaking and convicting our hearts, my own included, because I'm not going to preach a message like this and then try to act like it doesn't apply to me. What I am going to do is just ask the questions. Are we on guard? Are we being discerning? Are we aware of the spiritual forces that work around us? Remember what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Have we been dining at tables that we shouldn't be? Have we opened up doors that need to remain closed? Have we set up an have we set up idols in our own lives or even in our church that have taken our attention off of the only one who is worthy of our worship and taken our gaze somewhere else? And really at the end of the day, to answer that question, that's between you and the Holy Spirit. But I encourage you to think about this. Consider this. All right, so from that light topic, we're gonna jump over to sexual morality. <laughs> what was I thinking with this series? <laughs> Once again, quick history lesson. If we think that our culture, that our current culture is saturated with sex, I, you might want to do some reading on the first century. One ancient writer puts it this way. We have prostitutes for the sake of pleasure. We have concubines for the sake of daily cohabitation. We have wives for the purpose of having children legitimately and for having a faithful guardian of our household affairs. We hear that and we go, what? But this was the culture. This was the norm of the day. This was totally acceptable behavior. And f- but followers of Jesus, called to be Christ-like, called to be set apart, called to be in the world but not of the world. So for new believers coming to Jesus at this time, they had to shift their whole way of thinking, their whole way of living in the area of sex. Because what was acceptable by cultural standards yesterday no longer measures up to the new standard they've been called to in Christ today. Do you see now why the issue of sexual immorality was such a constant topic in the writing of the New Testament? It was one of the biggest things you're dealing with because the culture was so permissible of what, was, of, of what they could do, and it shifted so drastically when they came into relationship with Jesus Christ. So let's bring this issue into our context. I think the church is really good at pointing out sexual morality in the world. Look at what they're doing. It's so bad. It's so wrong. We should have them stop that. But but how are we doing with pointing it out within the church, within our own lives? It's really easy to point fingers out there at people who don't even know Jesus. But how are we at pointing fingers and examining our own lives 
the people in our church who claim to be followers of Jesus. And there are a few norms in our culture that are unfortunately far too prevalent in the church. The use of pornography being one of them, infidelity being the other. And just so I don't get accused of soapboxing, I am trying to draw some parallels here from first century to modern times. So they talk about the proliferation of, of prostitutes for the sake of pleasure. You don't have to draw a very long line to link that to pornography use and, and that entire arena of, of, um, of sexual morality. When they talk about concubines for companionship, it's not hard to draw that line to infidelity and to going outside the bounds of marriage. If you take a poll, you will find the vast majority of our North American culture has no issue with the regular consumption of pornography. If you take a look around in our culture, you see a rise in open marriages. You see a rise in the acceptability of multiple partners at the same time. You see a rise in what we call permissible affairs where both people just agree that it's okay. You'd think that the church, that followers of Jesus, would stand out as, as different from the cultural norm. And though the percentage does tend to be lower, both issues are often the norm within the church as well. Which really just reveals a disconnect between belief and behavior. Either the gospel hasn't changed lives, or you've bought into the lie of false teaching that's wrapped in gospel language that, like, these things are okay because we're covered. And here's the even more sad reality is that more often than not, the, this level of sexual immorality within the church, within Christian circles, it starts with the leaders. Somewhere between 50 to 60% of pastors and church leaders actively struggle with pornography. In one anonymous survey, 33% of pastors polled admitted to crossing the line with someone who is not their spouse and not getting caught for it. Those numbers are shockingly high. And if you've turned on the news in recent days and weeks, the news is rife right now with reports of sexual abuse and spiritual manipulation being covered up for years in whole denominations in order to protect the leadership. Now, I'm not giving the average churchgoer an excuse. We're all responsible for our own actions. But how can any of us live according to a godly standard when the leaders we've entrusted with setting the example are the ones who are living like the world? And to take it one step farther, when the shepherd is the one preying on the sheep, what hope do the sheep have? We have to do better. Church leaders have to do better. We as the church of Jesus Christ have to do better. We have been called. We have been chosen. We have been set apart. We are his people. We don't belong to the world. We are to be his faithful witnesses and examples of both his love and his holiness. His plan for us is not for marriages to fall apart. It's not for families to be torn apart. It's not for relationships to be broken. His plan for us is, is not for us to have unhealthy boundaries where we just do whatever we want and fall victim to temptation. His plan for us is so much greater and perfect and fuller than that. Sexual immorality is still a big deal. So let's please stop telling the world how to live and check our own lives first. Now, I figure, I figure I'm allowed to be hot about this because Jesus is hot about it. Did you catch that in the letter? Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In other words, stop what you're doing and turn around. If not, I'm coming down there for a fight. Well, this is a different side of Jesus, isn't it? Why this tone, we might ask? Why, why is he chosen to speak this way? Because he knows what's at stake. He knows that the truth will set us free. He, Jesus loves the truth. He speaks the truth. He is the truth. He came so that we might be freed from the prison of sin. But the opposite is also true. Falsehood and deception enslave. Idolatry enslaves. Pornography enslaves. Infidelity enslaves. It grieves his heart to see his people deceived. It grieves his heart to see his people in bondage. You see, the world would say, where is your freedom? We can do whatever we want over here, but you have to follow the rules of your God. And the great irony is this, in doing whatever we want, more often than not, humanity is led astray and enslaved to sin. But in following the boundaries, the loving guidelines established by God, we find freedom and fullness of life like no other. So Jesus says, repent. 
Turn from the lies and deception. Turn from the false ways of thinking and living. Turn from the idolatry. Turn from the pornography. Turn from the infidelity. Turn to Jesus and live victoriously. And when it comes to living victoriously, this letter comes with not one, not two, but three promises. And of course, they all require explanation, right? It says, to the one who's victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I'll also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. So let's unpack those ideas there. Hidden manna, if we know our Old Testament, we know that manna was the food that God provided for the Israelites in the wilderness. Manna is a picture of God's perfect provision. The hidden manna offered here is, is God's way of saying, why are you fooling around eating at the tables of lesser gods when you can come to me, the bread of life, and eat true food that truly satisfies? Hidden man is this offer to come to Jesus. I will be your sustenance. I will be your provision. And then the white stones. The white stone is a really interesting one. In the ancient world, the white stone had many associations. It could be used as a ticket, a ticket to a banquet. It, uh, it could be used as proof of acquittal in a court of law, both of which make theological sense in this context. But a white stone was also a sign, a badge of friendship. Here, here's, here's how it's explained. When two friends were about to part, they would divide a white stone in half. Each friend would inscribe his or her name on one of the halves and give it to the other. It then became a symbol of their friendship and the symbol of their promise to maintain that friendship as long as the stone lasted. The white stone is a picture of God's intimate friendship with us. Come to me, he says, and you will find a relationship like no other. And then on that white stone is written a new name. The old has gone, the new has come. In Christ, you are a new creation. He calls us by name and gives us a new identity in him. And the name written on the white stone is the name of the victor. So we come to a close. Let's come back to this rope. Let's come back to this image of a tug of war. See, one thing I learned as someone who's not overly strong physically and isn't really built for a tug of war I learned that there's a point of no return where you've held on too long and whether you win or lose you're going to get hurt no matter how the outcome of the game goes you're going to pay the price Jesus' command to the church in Pergamum is simple he says repent stop what you're doing go in the other direction or using the language we find earlier in the matter in the message in the letter Let go of what you're holding on to and hold fast to him. Drop the rope before you pass the point of no return. Stop the tug of war. Give up on the back and forth. Hold fast to him because ultimately it is he, it is God who will fight our battles. Idolatry, pornography, infidelity, any number of false ideas or false mindsets, lies or deceptions from the enemy, just stop the tug of war. You may gain a few feet now and then, then you get pulled right back in. Stop what you're doing. Drop the rope. Turn around. Hold fast to him. And in doing so, receive the manna. Receive the stone. Find sustenance and intimacy unlike anything you've ever known. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is speaking. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word today. Thank you that you are speaking to us. And I recognize that in unpacking this and in diving into what you're speaking, we hit some pretty touchy areas. We hit some pretty deep areas. We, we look at some things that may have uncovered some deep-rooted struggles and issues. So God, I pray for anyone today who is struggling, anyone today who finds themselves caught in a tug of war, caught in a battle for their mind. God, I pray victory in the name of Jesus. I pray for release from bondage in the name of Jesus. I pray for freedom in the name of Jesus. I pray for the the strength and the maturity to just drop the rope, to let it go, to stop holding on to whatever false teaching deception that's taken root. Just pray that they would be able to drop the rope, 
turn around, hold on to you, trust you for the victory. And God, we believe for freedom for the captives. We believe for the chains to fall off in the name of Jesus. Pray for those watching and listening today. Pray that they would not feel judged. Pray that they would not feel beat up. I pray that God's grace and his love would cover all that's been said. And that everyone listening and watching would understand the immense love that God has for you. That he speaks these often harsh things, not because he wants to beat you up, but because he cares so deeply for you. He wants so very much for your life to work and for you to be in relationship with him. That he points things out and goes, you need, you need to let go of this so you can come into all that I have for you. So I pray for that invitation to be accepted today. I pray that people would not be turned away in judgment, but would be drawn towards the immense love and grace that you have for us. And the last thing is this, if you're watching today and you've never made a decision for Jesus, this is your opportunity. No matter how difficult things are, no matter how much you're struggling with right now, Jesus is inviting you to come into a relationship with him. He's asking you to let go of what you're holding on to. He'll take it. He'll fight the battle. He'll take your struggles and your burdens. He'll take it on himself. So if you're looking today to enter into a relationship with Jesus, the person who created you, the person who saved your soul, the person who loves you and cares for you more than anyone else ever could, just pray this along with me. Jesus, I recognize that I am in need of you. I recognize that I can't win the battle for my mind on my own. I can't win this tug of war of life on my own. I let it go. And I pick you up. I ask for your love and your grace, your mercy, your peace to come flooding into my life today. I commit to walking in the ways you've asked me to. And I let go of the things that would hold me back from all that you have for me. I ask and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. If that was you, we want to celebrate with you. What an incredible decision you just made. And we want to, we want to acknowledge that. We want to celebrate with you. We want to make sure um, we get a Bible in your hands and we give you some information on how you can follow up the decision and get involved. So please let someone know. Call the church office. Talk to the person to invite you to church. Um, yeah, let us know. We want to celebrate with you and help you out. Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we've kind of dealt with a bunch of heavy things today. If you are struggling in certain areas, you're not alone. Uh, we'd love to pray for you. We'd love to talk to you. Um, so please reach out if you are in need. Reach out if you're struggling. We'd love to get you connected with someone who can help you walk through what you're dealing with and uh, help you to find the freedom that Jesus Christ offers you. That's our service for today. So glad you joined with us today. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And you're also glad that you're with us. Uh, we love you guys. We care for you. We'll see you soon. God bless.